Okay, I'm just setting up the recording here. <clears throat> Great. So, okay. Great, welcome folks to our September webinar. My name is Steve Gabriel. I'm an extension specialist with the Cornell Small Farm Program. The Specialty Mushroom Project that we're running is a partnership between the Small Farms Program and CCE Harvest New York, which is a statewide extension team. We specifically are working with um, two ag specialists in, um, uh, uh, in New York City. Um, we have uh, Yolanda Gonzalez and Sam Anderson, who do work in New York City. So we're interested in increasing the number of mushroom growers and providing the um, technical support um, in order to have those folks thrive wherever you may be, not just in the city, but in rural areas as well. Our focus for this project is uh, in the Northeast US, but I, a lot of the resources and materials are gonna be applicable across the, across the United States. So if you're tuning in from outside of that region, um, you're welcome and encouraged to take advantage of what we have to offer. Um, <clears throat> so this video is gonna be focused on growing oyster mushrooms on straw. And then our second video for the September series will be uh, from Willie Crosby of Fungi Ally, who will share his experience starting a mushroom farm and also introduce you to a really exciting project that we're partnering on that's gonna provide additional support and training for folks who are uh, existing mushroom growers or uh, looking to get into mushroom farming. So I'll mention in addition to Fungi Ally and CCE Harvest New York, we uh, reach across a lot of different sectors here we're partnering with a lot of wonderful organizations as well as mushroom businesses. Uh, many of these mushroom uh, suppliers supply materials, supply spawn, um, and also do education. I, I think everyone is interested in increasing the knowledge and the understanding across the field. And what I love, I think, about uh, you know, above many other things, is how collaborative and supportive the mushroom industry is. So, um, so I just acknowledge these partners from the outset, who are really a big part of this project. Um, as I mentioned, this is a, a monthly webinar series, so we have three more coming up um, uh, in 2019. Um, and it's the first Wednesday of the month. We usually do it from 3 to 4 p.m., 4.30 p.m. Eastern time uh, with two sessions. So we usually have two different topics, two different speakers, sometimes more. And um, um, our, uh, if you can't attend or you want to review something later, we have um, an opportunity to do that on our YouTube channel. Um, and you can find that through cornellmushrooms.org or you can go to the Cornell Small Farms YouTube and look for the Specialty Mushroom Webinar playlist. Um, I'm really excited to mention that uh, we have um, some wonderful updates to our website. So we've, uh, if you go to cornellmushrooms.org, you'll find a brand new website. Um, and we've reorganized the content, we've updated some of the content, and over the next three to six months, we'll be adding lots of new stuff. And if you um, go to the website and click on the button that says connect or network, you can join our grower listserv if you're not already a part of it. There's just a short form to fill out there. That's a great place to um, ask questions of fellow growers um, and our extension team, as well as find out about these updates. So we're gonna have new videos, new booklets, new fact sheets, these kind of things coming out uh, over the course of the project here. So do check out the website. It's a clearinghouse for all the things we currently have and will have in the future. Um, so things like uh, videos of how to do inoculation. Um, we have some guidebooks that are printable and other uh, links to suppliers and, and other kind of materials you need to get started and succeed. And uh, I just like to mention every webinar, just to be clear, the USDA is using this term specialty mushrooms. And so we just want to be clear about what that means. Essentially, a specialty mushroom is anything that is not uh, an agaricus by sporus. Agaricus by sporus is the Latin name for the button mushroom, the cremini, and the portobello. Those are actually all the same species of mushroom. So, and that comprises well over 90% of the mushrooms consumed commercially in the U U.S. right now. So specialty mushrooms are anything else. And so we're focused on that because um, the industry in the button mushroom production uh, sphere is quite established. And we're looking to support small and mid-sized farms that are able to capture a higher price point and usually able to offer a, a high quality product uh, due to the fact that a lot of these specialty mushrooms um, 
are best uh, grown and distributed as local as locally as possible. And some of the reason is because they really vary in some of their ability to travel and store. So in the case of shiitake there, the picture on the top left, it's actually quite a robust mushroom and it does quite well um, in terms of travel, but the one on the bottom there, lion's mane, is, is one that struggles uh, quite a bit more uh, in transport. So as small and medium-sized growers, we're able to um, capture that value, uh, provide food to local markets, and, and do well for ourselves. So that's really our focus in the project. And the project really has um, a couple different facets. We have our online courses and other resources I mentioned on the website. Uh, we do do a number of hands-on classes. Um, uh, again, you can check the website for those announcements. We're doing some this summer in New York City. Uh, as we move into the fall and winter, there'll be some others around the region. And as I mentioned, Willie, who will be on the second half of this, is also doing a series of 10 workshops all over the Northeast, which I'm sure he's going to speak about. Uh, the other piece of our work, uh, in addition to education and extension, is, is to do research. And so we're currently working on a, a number of um, projects where we're prototyping and calculating the costs, um, the labor inputs, and the material uh, considerations when we look at um, developing and, and utilizing indoor spaces for mushroom production. So um, stay tuned for more on that. Uh, I did outline the research project in a previous webinar if you want to go back and have a look at that. So <clears throat> that's just a little background about our project, just to keep folks up to speed. Um, we're going to talk about straw specifically, and specifically oysters on straw. So the first question really is, you know, why why are we talking about straw, um, and and how does it differ from where mushrooms are normally grown? So uh, most indoor mushroom production uh, that's commercially happening right now, um, folks are using uh, most commonly. Uh, sterilized blocks of sawdust with some kind of supplement. And the sawdust acts as a carbon food source for the mushrooms, whereas the supplement, which is often some kind of um, grain hull or agricultural byproduct or coffee ground or something like that, that serves as a nutritive addit additive. It's generally higher in other minerals and in nitrogen. So if you're familiar with composting, we have carbon, we have nitrogen. These are the basic building blocks of a good compost pile. They're also the basic building blocks of a food source or a substrate that we grow mushrooms on. So straw is really just pretty much carbon rich and it offers several advantages. And when we just talk about growing on just straw, what we're really doing is we're um, leveraging a specific type of system that allows us to do mushroom production at a sort of a lower tech type of scale. So essentially what we're looking at with straw is we're looking at uh, systems that need less, less infrastructure in terms of the production of the uh, fruiting material and management. We don't have to worry as much or focus as much about sterile treatments. We can get away with some lower tech treatments as we refer them to. And so this is a very adaptable practice that we see happening uh, globally and not just with straw, but whatever kind of similar um, product is available. And there's always something high in carbon and brittle uh, that we can work with in oyster production. Um, so we heard in a previous webinar from Gina who had done work in Nepal with uh, oyster mushroom production, they were using um, agricultural byproducts there that were straw-like and they were growing oysters on them. So it's very adaptable and very transportable. Um, and then, you know, because we're working with less sterility and because we're working with a food source, a substrate that's low in, in nitrogen, low in nutrition, the uh, oysters can take advantage of that and fruit, but we don't have to worry as much about contamination because there's less interest from, let's say, the competitors out there, the other um, molds and things like that. But what really the, the trade-off for using straw is we're going to get lower yields. So when we, when we take out some of the nutrition, we take out some of the nitrogen, we're going to overall have lower yields per pound of material that we're inoculating. But there's still su um, substantial yields and I think still very worthwhile yields. So the other question then is, well, why only oyster mushrooms? Why are we focused just on those? And um, the main reason for that is because oyster, mycelium, oyster is the um, pleurotus species and there's several subspecies to that, several variations even of the main species. Um, it's incredibly adaptable. It grows on the widest number of things in the world. Oyster mushrooms are found on pretty much every terrestrial continent, except for the most extreme environments. And its mycelium is incredibly adaptive, and it grows incredibly fast. So oyster is really what we start with because it has um, those qualities which allow it to, to make really good use of, 
of straw. Um, so I, I put only in quotations because um, I think theoretically there's other opportunities for other species to work with straw, but I don't think they're sort of ready for prime time. I think that more selective breeding work, more um, uh, playing around, more experimentation is needed. So oyster on straw is really a, a product that we can actually start to kind of take to market and, and it's sort of ready for commercial production. So we're going to walk through the steps of straw production with oyster mushrooms. Talk to you from my personal experience. I do uh, farm mushrooms as well as work for the extension program here. Um, and we have been growing oysters on straw for a number of years. And we've also grown them on supplemented sawdust. So I have a little bit of experience with both. And again, you know, none of these systems is perfect. They all have their kind of pros and cons. Um, I think for a farm, especially farms that might have diversified products and don't want to necessarily go um, into the full kind of growing of just mushrooms and kind of specialize in that, I think that oysters on straw provide a really good potential uh, for folks to consider and, and be able to kind of, um, uh, let's see, integrate into their production systems um, with relatively low cost. So first thing we're gonna do is source our substrate. So um, the beautiful thing about straw, if you can uh, have access to it, is that we're talking about 40 pounds of dry material that's baled and that is easily stackable. And, um, and that's a real big advantage when we start to think about um, um, handling materials that we're gonna grow for mushrooms. Now, if you're not in an area where it's easy to acquire straw, and in some years, frankly, this is actually a pretty poor straw year for us in central New York because of the cool spring and the excessive rains. Um, we haven't had a great season, so straw is actually quite scarce right now. Uh, but in most seasons, it's pretty easy for us to find, you know, a, a 40 pound, pound bale is usually um, somewhere in the range of four to six dollars. Um, but if you're um, having a hard time finding straw, you can actually order it online. You can find shredded straw in bale form and you can have it shipped to you. So this is an example here. Easy Straw is a company that does this. Um, it's important that you make sure that you get their Just Straw product if you're going to do this um, because they have other straw products that are meant for animal bedding and they have additives to them, which you don't want. So you just want a pure straw product. Uh, many um, farm supply stores, agricultural supply stores sell bales of pre-shredded straw. We're going to talk about why shredding is important. So if you want to just buy in this material, I think it's still um, cost effective. These bales can range anywhere from $10 to $20 a piece, and it's about a cubic foot. So it's a lot less volume for, for the price, but it is pre-shredded, which has some advantages. I do want to have presence and encourage the consideration that we could actually use a lot of other things, as I mentioned from the top. And we've had students in the past play with all sorts of materials that are essentially brittle, dry, and high in carbon. And so um, I've had folks grow oyster mushrooms on, um, on knotweed, Japanese knotweed. They actually harvest and dry it and shred it and do the same process that we're talking about. Um, I've had folks use um, cattails or um, purple loosestrife or something that's um, considered invasive, quote unquote, that might be an incentive for them to actually harvest or remove that material is, is that incentive is to grow mushrooms on it. And so I encourage folks to experiment and know that as you experiment and kind of deviate from the things we talk about, you're increasing your... Um, your risk in terms of that productive capacity. So if your goal is really to produce high quality mushrooms on a consistent basis, well, you take less risk. And that's really, that's true in every agricultural pursuit. There's lots of different options out there that we could start to um, play with. And I would encourage experimentation. We need folks in the community to be experimenting and, and finding new, new solutions. So again, I wanna emphasize that substrates, not all of them are sort of created equal. So we look at substrates most basically in terms of, are they a carbon heavy substrate? Are they more of a nutritive or nitrogen rich substrate? So um, straw does not compare to coffee grounds, for instance. Coffee grounds are particularly high in nutrients, high in nitrogen. That increases their uh, yield potential, but it also increases the contamination. And you can have uh, some success growing uh, oysters straight in coffee grounds, but most cases you want to dilute them and you actually have to clean them before you use them. So it's important that your substrate is fresh, it's, it's clean. If you're thinking about commercial production, it really needs to be consistent, it needs to be very efficient. So I could go out and gather all the Japanese knotweed I want on my property, but how long is it going to take me to make a 40 pound bales worth of material, right? When I can purchase that from my farmer friend who does organic straw for $5 a bale, right? So you all to think about that and again it depends on to what level of sort of experimentation versus commercial aspiration you have. Um, we'll talk a bit about treatment methods 
um, your intentions. So a lot of folks get into mushroom farming wanting to think about low impact. So, you know, am I using a material that's a raw material? Am I using something that's a recycled material? Um, and so these are all factors to consider as you're thinking about sourcing your substrates for production. But we're going to talk about straw as that basic building block. And what I'd recommend is if you want to get started and you want to learn um, how to do it well, start with straw. And then you can deviate and start to experiment with other things as you gain confidence in the system. So after we acquire our materials, then we're going to shred it. And the real reason to shred um, <coughs> straw or any uh, similar material is because uh, these materials most often have, uh, especially straw, have uh, heavy lignin content. And so that's the waxy coating that you find on the, on the fibers of lo the long sort of strands of straw. So if you don't shred that, then the mycelium of the oyster has to take extra effort to break that down. And every time it's putting more energy into that kind of work, it's putting less energy into fruiting. It's also slowing down its growth and its expansion, and that means the potential for contamination. So by shredding it, what we do is we start to break that process down a bit. We also increase the surface area, and we make it a, a very easy for us to pack a lot of material into a small space, leaving air pockets, but mainly giving um, the mycelium a, a easy opportunity to jump from one strand to the next. If you try to pack full strands of straw into a container, it's a very different scenario for that mycelium than when you shred it. So shredding is good and most uh, small scale producers will, uh, will start working with something as simple as a chip or shredder that's allocated pretty much exclusively to this process where they're shredding a bale. It might take, on our farm it takes like 15 minutes or so to shred a 40 pound bale in this kind of contraption. And you can of course get a larger, more efficient kind of bale shredder. There's attachments for tractors, all sorts of things like that. Um, if you're not interested in investing or, or don't have those materials available, there's lots of kind of um, uh, hack methods, we'll call them, a uh, weed whacker in a barrel, or you know, simply here you can see they're running over it with a mower. Some people will chip it up or chop it up by hand, but anything you can do to break this up is a really important and valuable thing, and it's gonna increase your yields. Um, one of our research questions is, well, how much will it increase your yields? A lot of the sort of general knowledge out there says it could double your yields to shred this material before you actually inoculate it. <clears throat> Once we've shredded it, we're gonna basically need to treat that material. Okay, and uh, what most growers get into is some kind of, um, once you shred this material, you're going to want to contain it. Um, because uh, what we can imagine is at different scales, what we're going to end up doing is submerging this in water, either hot water or cold water. We may be adding something else. We may not be. We'll talk about those treatment methods in a second. <coughs> but it's, it's a material that you're going to then pull out of that water. So you need to think very carefully about how you're going to do that efficiently without losing everything. So. When we started, we used to just kind of throw it all in a barrel, we'd do our treatment, and then we'd scoop it all out. Well, that's, that's pretty labor intensive. And so there's lots of innovative folks out there who build these wire baskets. They think about using a block and pulley system or a jack or something to pull this material out because it gets quite heavy if you're pulling it out of a big barrel. But some kind of thing is nice. We've used pillowcases as kind of tea bags, that kind of thing. It's worth thinking about that as you get in. So there's four main methods for treating straw. And um, uh, again, you can experiment with this. And uh, if you visit Fungi Allies website, um, there is a booklet uh, that Willie produced about uh, oyster straw production. And one of the things he did was compare the heat method with lime with, um, with ash, with adding wood ash, which is basically a low, sort of low input way to do the lime soak because ash is going to change the pH of the material. So um, he compared those and found that the heat and the lime treatments were, were pretty competitive in terms of their consistent yields. So what treatment is, is after is essentially to clean uh, our material, our straw, and essentially create um, uh, you know, a, a less hospitable environment for our contaminants and an a, a environment that is tolerable or preferable to the oyster mycelium. Right? So we're kind of trying to eliminate the competition or at least knock it back and then get that oyster in there and give it a chance to get rolling um, as, it's, as it's able and kind of get ahead of the competition. So, so these are low tech methods because we're not going to the full sterilization uh, treatment that we might do with sawdust production. So the lowest, lowest tech is just a cold water fermentation, which we call the stinky straw method, which is really what we're doing is we're submerging this um, material, the straw or other material in water for as little as five and as at most 10 days. And the way you know it's ready is because it, it smells 
that awful. <laughs> um, it is basically because we're allowing this material to be uh, overcome with um, anaerobic bacteria. And so um, this is a way to clean it. This is definitely the lowest tech way. And if you're uh, inoculating in an area where you don't have access to um, lime, which is, um, you know, it's an industrial material that's produced, or you don't have access to propane or some kind of heat source, you might want to consider this as a viable way. The downside is that it really does stink and it'll get over your clothes and your hands and it's it's not um, a super fun way necessarily. And of course you have to wait quite a bit of time and it'll vary depending on the ambient temperature outside. Um, lime is another option. The idea here is that we're changing uh, the pH of the water. We're creating a, a high pH uh, alkaline um, uh, scenario, which the oyster mycelium is, is able to tolerate, but most contaminants have a harder time growing in. And so, uh, you know, one suggestion is you can use, again, wood ash, but uh, most commonly when folks are looking at commercial production, they're using what is known as hydrated mason's lime. This is a very specific type of lime from a very specific, uh, you know, set of limestone. And so you have to really search out and sometimes your local store may have it. Sometimes you can find it online. Sometimes it can be really hard to find and that all depends. And you need to find, um, the, the rock of origin needs to have um, a low magnesium content, so it needs to have less than 10% magnesium. You need to make sure that that's present before you use it. So I didn't know that the first time I did this, and we bought a whole bunch. Turns out it was very high in magnesium. It doesn't really effectively treat the material. So lime can be an effective way to do that. That's a cold water soak. You're just soaking it generally for 16 to 20 hours, um, and then you want to test the material with a pH strip before you inoculate. Hydrogen peroxide is not something I've used personally, but I've heard of folks having success with it. Um, and this is one recommended dosage. Uh, but again, with these, a lot of folks are experimenting with different amounts and trying to figure that out. And then finally, probably the most common is to just heat the straw, essentially cook it. And when folks get started in straw production, often they just do it on their kitchen stove in a, in a pot. Um, and generally, the, the goal is to get the straw water up to 145 to 175 degrees for two hours. Although I've heard people do it for as little as 60 minutes, 90 minutes, something like that. Um, so that's all possible. Um, after, uh, um, it, so, so one strategy I should say is you don't necessarily have to keep the heat on all the time boiling during that. You can heat it up to about 180, 185 degrees, shut off your, your heat source and then cap it. And usually that'll keep your material for two hours at a warm enough temperature to essentially pasteurize it, which is, which is a good strategy. Um, really what we can think about is uh, using really simple and easy to find uh, containers to do this kind of treatment. Um, uh, depending, obviously if you're going to heat it, a plastic bucket wouldn't work well. Um, again, when folks start off and I find them using uh, you know, a, a large canning pot on their on their kitchen stove. They can do these same kind of treatments just at a smaller scale. Generally speaking, a 55 gallon drum will do uh, about one bale of, uh, of straw in terms of treatment, right? right? Whether you soak it and do the ferment, the stinky straw, whether you use lime, uh, whether you uh, heat it and, and pasteurize it. Again, here's an example here on our farm. This is a lime uh, material that we're using and we are uh, using basically uh, several pillowcases where we're filling up the shredded straw, soaking it in that material, and then um, going from there. As I mentioned, uh, with lime, it's really important that you do check the pH and make sure you're getting enough. Uh, again, depending on your lime uh, constituency, what's what it's made of, because not all lime is the same, you may have different um, responses. So you need to kind of check and make sure that things are working um, well for you. And then I think most common, I believe I actually borrowed this from Willie's booklet, um, you know, a turkey fryer, a, a propane tank, some cinder blocks, and a 55-gallon drum. And that's really all you need to get started in treating straw um, in the pasteurization method, right? Of course, take away the turkey fryer, take away the, the propane, and you have a barrel, and that's all you really need if you want to do lime or, or the cold water or the hydrogen peroxide uh, treatment. And so... Um, lots of options here, but pretty low tech, pretty simple. A couple more pictures here. This is a picture I borrowed from the internet where we have a really simple structure. You can see a, a simple um, come along that's helping lift this out of the barrel, which is really nice to think about a system that doesn't break your back, um, but a really simple setup. And then they have that nice little table there that they're going to dump this on and do their inoculation. So having some kind of clean surface that's already ready to go that you can uh, transfer the material to to do your inoculation is a really important stage of the process.
Here's an old uh, like school desk that you know they're able to wipe, wipe down with some bleach, uh, light bleach water, vinegar water, whatever, clean it. Uh, with hot pasteurization, uh, a big difference from the other methods is you do have to cool the material before you inoculate it. So you need to kind of turn it or rake it or move it and try to cool it down as quickly as possible. Some people will put a fan over it. Um, you want to cool it down as quickly as possible so you can inoculate it, get it in its containers, and not let it sit around so that you don't have other things landing on it, right? So this is all, um, this is all pretty important. So that's in, that's in consideration. Uh, we use an old um, insert for a truck and um, uh, and like a, you know what I mean, like an insert for a, a pickup truck bed, right? So we use that, we can hose that down, we can clean it. We dump our material in there and then we are able to cool it and inoculate it. Uh, here's a fella, this is a monastery in New York, I don't remember exactly where, where they have just some, uh, some tarps there and they're cooling their substrate and then he's just tossing the, um, the uh, inoculated, the spawn right into that, right into that material, okay? Uh, for us, we were playing uh, in this. This is a 55 gallon drum that we're, when we do our treatment, we put this pipe in the middle with holes drilled in it. This was so we could put our lime water in there and get an even distribution because if you just pour it on top, sometimes it doesn't mix well. So that's an important factor if you work with lime is to make sure that it's evenly distributed. You have to dissolve the powder in the water, you know, and then make sure it gets to all the material and it's actually soaking. So. Some considerations as you look at those different treatments to make sure that you're getting good coverage on your material and that it's working well. So after we do our treatment, and I encourage again folks to experiment with different ones, there might be ones that are more, more appropriate or less appropriate for your context, for your budget, um, and, and all that uh, good stuff. Um, what we're going to do then is introduce our spawn. So if you're not familiar, spawn is mycelium that has been uh, cultured. Um, in a lab setting, in a sterile setting, and the spawn is ready for inoculation. And what we'd recommend for straw cultivation is that you get grain spawn, because that grain is going to give the mycelium a little bit of nutrition that is, again, absent in the, um, in the material that we're, um, that we're inoculating. And so it gives us a little bit of nutrition without, an, you know, again, increasing, you know, our potential for some kind of contaminant. So grain spawn, if you're not familiar with suppliers, again, cornellmushrooms.org has a list of suppliers and you can find out what um, strains they have available. We'll talk about that in a minute. Generally, we recommend aiming for about five to 10% of the dry weight of your, of your material is in spawn. So if for a 40 pound bale, we're gonna use about four pounds. I usually use five pounds because it comes in five pound bags um, and it's pretty affordable to purchase that in. So we're talking about um, you know, depending on how much you buy and what arrangement you have, somewhere between $12 and $20 per bag that you're inoculating. And at a very minimum, you should be able to, out of that 40 pounds of material, you should be able to get 15 or 20 pounds of oyster mushrooms. So um, if you start doing the math, it's not a uh, hefty investment, but um, you could potentially increase your yields. When you start out, you might get lower yields. It all depends on, on several factors. What's really important when you uh, inoculate is the, the correct spawn rate. So we call that you know, the percentage of spawn that we're gonna put into our material. It's important that we pack it tight into whatever containers we're gonna use. And it's important that we maintain sort of relative cleanliness. So again, this is a low tech method. We don't need to be doing this in a sterile lab with a, a hood blowing you know, uh, HEPA filtered air at us. Uh, but we wanna be relatively clean. I don't wanna go do my sheep chores on the farm and then go inoculate my, my mushrooms, right? Um, so we often have spray bottles of hydrogen peroxide and we spray down our hands, we spray down the materials we're working with, we make sure the containers we're using are, are uber clean before we, we, we inoculate them, right? All these kind of things. And uh, strain is really important to consider, okay? And so let's talk about that. Cool. Um, depending on uh, your fruiting temperatures, so the space you're actually going to fruit these mushrooms in, what, they're gonna, what that's going to look like, you're going to start to think about the different options for strain. So a strain is um, sort of like with your, your tomatoes or your peppers or your carrots, you have a different range. And sometimes strains or cultivars are selected for color or flavor. Sometimes they're selected for their adaptability to different things. So in this case, there is some variation in terms of the flavor and texture of these different strains, but mostly what we look at is their response to different temperature ranges. Um, and these are approximate ranges. Um, people have different experiences and there's variation between the strains you're gonna, you're gonna be able to source um, from different suppliers. But in generally speaking, we have cold blue oyster, which is um, 
look, goes down to the lowest temperatures, can even uh, fruit in a low 40s, um, and generally starts to, to actually start to decline once the temperatures get above 70, where we can see the other mushrooms really thrive in warmer temperatures, such as the pinks, the goldens, the phoenix, that sort of thing. And there's a warm blue that kind of falls in between, and the whites are kind of in between as well. So sometimes when your space is going to change over the course of a season because you're going from spring to summer to fall you can kind of shift around your strains and think about how to adapt to different spaces if your if your space is always going to be a little warm you probably want to avoid your cold blue and, and think about pinks and goldens and um, you'll find over time as you get familiar with this and you play with these different strains that you know some growers really like to have the wide range and and grow all the things and some really like to hone in and focus on just one or two. Um, our farm is finding that the blue oysters are really what our customers um, are most interested in and that's mostly from a longevity standpoint they tend to hold up a lot better. So it's in our commercial interest to actually keep temperatures lower and produce mushrooms that are going to hold up on the shelf. The, the goldens and the pinks look gorgeous um, and they tend to be more brittle in terms of handling. But if I, was, if I was selling at a farmer's market, I would definitely be growing goldens and pinks because um, they have such an eye appeal and you'll get people to, to purchase them and check you out just because you have some pink food, which is a, not, a, not a common thing to find, right? So, so strains are an interesting conversation. We could probably you know, continue the rest of the webinar talking about, but suffice to say for now, the, the starting point is to think a bit about your fruiting space, your growing space, and what might um, best fit. So back to containers, back to packing. There's a couple different theories. You saw the fellow who was the monk in the monastery. He had laid his material out and then he sprinkled his spawn essentially throughout and he mixed it in. Um, other folks do a layering method. So what we've often done at our farm with these buckets is we'll do like two or three inches of straw. We'll pack it down and then we'll layer, a, we'll sprinkle a layer of grain spawn and then we'll do another layer of three, four inches of straw, pack it down. So there's kind of different theories and different preferences. You know, do I want those grains sort of mixed all uh, interspersed with the straw spread throughout or do I want these kind of layers that the mycelium can kind of form a casing and then move up and down from there. And again, I don't think there's a right or wrong. I think it's worth experimenting and trying with. Um, so here we are with buckets. These are buckets that we were able to source from a friend who worked in a laboratory. These buckets had hydrogen peroxide in them before we got them, so incredibly clean. Um, I will say that reusable containers, I think, ethically align with my values and what I want to do. Efficiency-wise, they're incredibly challenging to clean and keep clean and make sure that by the next time you use them or the third time or the fourth time, that you're not introducing contaminants into. So this is why a lot of the industry is, is heavily relying on, on virgin plastic or recycled plastic, but that's made sort of fresh um, as a substrate, as a, as a container for production. Um, it is a challenge. And I think our last webinar, um, Jesse spoke really interestingly about ways he's thinking about um, low tech and sort of environmentally friendly ways. And I think it's a conversation our community will continue to have is how to reduce the amount of plastic use. So our goal with the farm here was to do this. We had some initial success. We've also had some contamination problems. And, and frankly, the buckets tend to pile up when the farm gets busy because cleaning buckets is not the top of our list all the time. Um, for our buckets, we, we fabricated a really simple um, a tamper that fit the bucket perfectly. We used one of those sono tubes and some homemade you know, cement just a, a powdered bag that we made and we got a, a tool handle and we basically made a custom tamper that really helped and you really can't compact your straw too much. You'll still have air pockets in there and you really want that mycelium to move quite quickly. So uh, even something heavy like that was really effective in terms of efficiently doing our inoculations. And so buckets are really nice because you can, uh, you know, they're reusable and they work well and uh, as long as you can keep them clean and um, and they stack, and we really like that. So our, our space, our growing space was very flexible and adaptable. And this is essentially in a high tunnel that we're, we're fruiting these in. Um, we've also used plastic tubing, uh, which is really nice in different ways. You can, you can kind of grow uh, different lengths depending on your space. Um, generally speaking, the black tubing is what we use, but we always do a couple clear bags so we can actually see what's going on. And you can see really nicely there, that's the layered method where we have these kind of layers of grain spawn uh, interspersed with a straw. And I, I tend to prefer that. I think it works well because the mycelium then creates one kind of colony and, it, and then it moves, uh, you know, up and down the bag and it seems to do quite well. So um, from our experience, that's, that's tended to work out the best. But 
we kind of flip flop between these materials. We had some contamination issues last year, as I mentioned, and we switched to the, the tubes. And, and then some weeks we did a mixture of buckets and tubes. And, um, and, and so there's, there's some choices to be made there. But you can buy this tubular plastic in bulk um, from suppliers and, and it's quite nice. And then of course you can hang it and move it uh, all around. Lots of other containers to play with. I think the biggest thing, you know, I do think our, our, our general industry, I hope we use uh, more and more reusable containers. We figure out ways to do that efficiently. Um, it's important that your containers, generally speaking, aren't translucent. That often can inhibit uh, mycelium growth or in the contrast, it can actually increase the growth of contaminant molds. And so it's important that your, your containers are generally not translucent. Um, you don't want to have too much exposed surface area. So we want to keep our oxygen kind of low. So a bag is really nice because you can kind of, um, uh, you know, the number of holes you poke in the bag is going to increase or decrease the oxygen. Um, this laundry basket here, this is a successful flush, but um, often when you have too much uh, exposure to air, you have low, uh, low performance from your mushrooms. So try different things. Let us know. Send us pictures. We'd love to see uh, what you come up with. Um, here's our uh, one of our collaborators, Chad Cotter of Mushroom Mountain and a farm he's working as an old dairy barn that they have been converting into mushroom production. So you can see in this scenario, um, the bags worked quite well because they were able to use the existing rafter infrastructure, uh, move the bags about. And these are these are quite hefty. Um, these are 12 inch diameter bags. And um, generally speaking, we don't recommend you go much bigger than that because you can actually generate too much heat. Um, from the mycelium growing. The mycelium itself that grows will generate heat and that can be a challenge as you think about managing the temperature uh, variation in whatever space you might be growing in. So finally, we're, we're, that's, that gives us sort of the rundown of, of sourcing our materials, inoculating treatment, all that kind of good stuff. And I'm going to stop there. So there's the next stage of this, no matter what kind of uh, mushroom production you're doing, is to think about, you know, shepherding this material through two different phases we call the incubation phase, which is when that mycelium is taking a hold of all the substrate. And then you have your fruiting um, phase, which is when the, the mushrooms are actually fruiting. And this slide just gives you a bit of a summary of um, what we're after. So incubation, we tend to want a very stable lower temperature. It doesn't have to be 65, maybe 70 is okay, but um, you know, we want it in a cooler range. We're really thinking about contamination. We want to make sure that's um, minimized because that's when it can um, affect the mycelium success. And then when we're fruiting, what we're really looking to do is, is think about the temperature relative to the strain. We're increasing the humidity and we're making sure there's enough fresh air because as mushrooms fruit, they really need a fresh supply of oxygen. So with these oyster straw methods, um, we're looking at somewhere between three and four weeks, um, sometimes longer, depending on your temperatures, from inoculation to your first fruiting. And you can have subsequent fruitings after that. Um, but you have to start thinking about space. And this could be a combination of indoor and outdoor space. It could be two indoor spaces. Um, they can be insulated. They cannot be insulated. We've had folks grow in all sorts of different things. And in a future webinar, we'll really dive into the, the considerations as we build out and, and maintain these types of spaces. Great, so I will, I'm gonna pause our recording here. And 